Hi. Hello, everyone. Today we're going to talk about um, the process of science, which is found in one point, chapter 1.3 in your text. Um, again, you should be looking at your guided notes, the third set of questions. I don't have them on the slide this time, but you should be looking at those and filling them out as we go through this. So the process of science is also referred to as a scientific method, and it's the means by which scientists formalize their experiments, their observations that have been tested over time, and gather knowledge. So all the information in your textbook is actually the result of the scientific method that's been done over years and years by all these different scientists. It's very logical. Our first lab in class is going to be to perform the scientific method. Um, so you'll have, uh, you'll have experience with it. So there's five steps, and I'm going to cover these steps in conjunction with an example because I feel like it's easier to understand if you're given an example versus just definitions. So we start really by observing the natural world, okay? And these observations more and more these days are done by reading information. And if you're an actively engaged scientist, you may also have a lab where you're doing preliminary experiments, looking under microscopes, and these are all in the category of observations, right? And so in the example I'm going to give you is that we have known by observation, by reading the work by previous scientists that ulcers, if you've ever heard of ulcers, are caused by bacteria. So ulcers are these sores in our stomach and in our intestine, and they're actually caused by bacteria. And um, doctors prescribe antibiotics specifically to kill bacteria. And let's say we observe that many doctors are prescribing a new antibiotic for ulcers. And we're going to refer to this as antibiotic B. And we're noticing that patients are getting better. And so maybe one thought is, well, is this new antibiotic necessarily better than the old one? Or is it the same? Or is it maybe worse? And doctors are just prescribing it because pharmaceutical companies are pushing them to do it. So we want to use the scientific method to try to kind of make sense of this observation. So we're going to use, this. I kind of said this already, we're going to use the scientific method to identify which antibiotic works best for the treatment of ulcers. So after we've made these observations, we're going to come up with a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is like a kind of an explanation for our observations. Um, and here, the example I'm providing is that this newly discovered antibiotic B is actually better to treat the ulcers than the old one, antibiotic A, which is the one that was more currently in use. And so, um, you know, at this point, it's not important whether the hypothesis is right or wrong, but what is very important is that the hypothesis is set up in such a way that we actually can test it, right? Can we test it? And the results of those tests can either support or negate the hypothesis. So after we come up with a testable hypothesis, we have to design experiments that actually will give us the results to support or negate the hypothesis. And so experiments are just procedures that we can do to try to answer this hypothesis. And in experimental design, um, it is really important to kind of have your results determine if that hypothesis was correct or not. And so in science, we kind of talk about um, experimental variable or independent variable. Um, so in this case, that would be the antibiotic, right? That's what we're testing. That's what we're focusing on. And why we want to make sure that all the results are based only on that independent variable. And so um, in this example, we can actually have three experimental groups. We can have what is called a control group in which the subjects or the patients 
are not treated with antibiotics. Okay, in, in medicine, often when these types of experiments are done, they're given what is called a placebo, which means let's say it looks like a pill and it looks exactly the same as the pill for antibiotics, but instead of being an antibiotic, it's just like a sugar pill or nothing. And this is so that the patients don't have preconceived notions about the results. And so they're kind of blind to whether they're being what they're being given. Then there would be a test group that has the antibiotic A on it. So this would be the older antibiotic. And then there'd be a test group with antibiotic B, the new one. And none of these subjects actually know what they're being given. Um, another thing about experimental design is that if we have these three groups, we want everything to be constant except for that experimental variable, that antibiotic, right? So for example, we don't want test subjects in test group B to be all young and healthy because then maybe they are going to get better, but not because of the experimental variable, that antibiotic, but maybe just because they're healthier people. Or we don't want them to be all men or all women because maybe there is a correlation with male and female and ulcers that we don't even know about it. So we want everything to be consistent among these three groups other than that variable that we're testing, the antibiotic. So we want people to be of the same age, the similar sex, or maybe equally distributed among the sexes. We want them to be healthy, right? Um, similar weight or BMI index. Um, so we want the differences between the groups to be minimized so that any result we can connect back to the antibiotics. All right, so we have these subjects and now we are going to somehow assess whether they are getting better from the ulcers. So in this example, it would be doing what is referred to as an endoscopy where they put a little tube in a camera, they put the subject to sleep and they look into the stomach. They can look at the lining to see if there's any sores. They can get into the intestine to see if there's any sores. Um, and so they'll gather all their results, um, all these subjects from the different groups. Do they have ulcers? Do they not? Do they get better? And they usually get their data, that's called data, and they graph it and they analyze it and they use statistics to see is this difference significant or not. And they come up with a chart, so effectiveness of treatment. And so if you look at this chart, you see that the control group was not very effective right, that sugar pill or, you know, any whatever placebo they were given, obviously didn't help very much. The test group one, all right, which was actually antibiotic A, was effective, definitely more than the control group, so you can say that, but then antibiotic B, which is test group two, was roughly 80% effective, so that was even more effective than the generally used antibiotic, right? So what can we say now? These results allow us to make a conclusion that on the basis of the data that was collected, the investigators conclude that their hypothesis is, and remember the hypothesis is that the newly discovered antibiotic B is better to treat the ulcer than the A. So they're gonna conclude that their hypothesis is supported, okay? And so from there, when scientists do these experiments, they wanna share them with the rest of the scientific community because that's how other scientists continue research. They read, you know, that's the beauty of science. We all share our data, our findings, and we do this in scientific journals that are referred to as peer-reviewed journals so that, okay, if I'm going to say a conclusion like antibiotic B is better than A, I can't just publish it. 
I send it to the journal, I explain what my experimental design is, and my peers, other scientists, read it before it's published to determine, hmm, did that Dr. Rios do good experimental design or not? And if they conclude that, yep, that experiment design was really good, her findings are justified, then it can get published. All right, that is it for this video lecture.